All right, hey everybody, and welcome to Chew Stream, where we talk about art and life as an artist. I'm your host, Bobby Chu, and I also have a bunch of guests on today. This one's a special one because we are live from the Workshop House outside of Montreal, Canada, in uh, Saint Julien. So if you can, I can't hear it, and they can't hear it, but we can feel it. Give us a Give them a big round of applause. Here are the people at the Workshop House. Hey, guys. How's it going? Hi. Hey. Yay. So we got uh, my buddy T-Bear on the very side over there where you can see an eyeball and a big hand. And, um, <laughs> and then, of course, we have going from my screen left to my screen right we have jenny from australia hello yeah. jenny and then we Hi. have jose from colombia and then we have Gemma from uh mexico yep. hey. hey guys how's it going hopefully you guys have been doing great this is your i believe third fourth week at the house Third week starting today. Excellent, okay. excellent. And for those of you that are tuning in live, and this is interactive, so we will be looking at your questions. You can feel free to ask your questions in the chat. Just be sure to write question in big capital letters so we can see it a lot easier. Okay, and, uh, you know, I have been traveling forever. I don't know how much you guys know, uh, but... It's been a whirlwind. I just got back from Florida. Before that, it was San Francisco. Before that, it was San Diego Comic Con. Before that, it was Tel Aviv. And then before that, it was China. And who knows what else before that. So um, I'm in town for a few days. And I want to, you know, kind of meet you guys and, and have a little FaceTime and kind of do a stream at the same time, you know, just kind of kill two birds with one stone. So you guys also had a <clears> bunch <throat> of questions for me, which is great. That way we aren't here just staring at each other and uh, smiling and everything. So why don't we go to some of your questions first? Does that sound good for you guys? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> me? I get some. Yeah. Are you ready for my questions? I don't know if I'm ready for your questions, but I, I am I'm ready to try. <laughs> I feel like there's so many good artists out there, but then the stuff it takes to be exceptional. An exceptional artist, I think to free an exceptional artist from a good artist. I'm sorry, it got a little bit choppy in the middle oh, there. No. So, um, can you repeat that? Can you repeat your question again, actually? <laughs> sorry, the stream was going perfectly good until we asked the first question, which just means that you know, Jenny has a really good question, so everybody keep your ears <laughs> Sorry. Do, you, do you want her to ask again? Uh, yes, please. Um, basically, what do you think differentiates a good artist from an exceptional artist? Ah, uh, well, I have a hierarchy. I have a hierarchy in my head of, like, um, good artists to great artists. Okay, so I guess first, art is an interpretation of life, right? So really good art is a really good interpretation of life where you look at it and you go, oh, that's so genius how this person represented life in this way. For example, you look at a duck and it looks super real from far away. Uh, and then all of a sudden, it, you look up close and it's like five different brushstrokes and you're like, oh my goodness, that interpretation of a duck was amazing. Right, so first it's having a good interpretation of life. And a lot of times that's based off of, not every time, there are exceptions, but most of the time it's based off of really good technical skills. It's, 
it has a good foundation, right? The next level of art is when you uh, create a really good emotional impact, right? And if you think about it, um, really good artists create good emotional impacts. It could be, oh, that's so funny. Oh, that's so cute. Oh, that's so lovable. Oh, that's so awe-inspiring. You know, like uh, Kim Jong Gi when he does those elaborate perspective. You know, f like five different points of perspective or something. You look at it and you're like, "Wow, it's awe-inspiring," right? So there's different levels of emotional impact or different kinds. That's what really good artists do, and then the great ones. The great ones do something that changes you. Art that is so impactful that it actually literally changes you. You know, like how Banksy changed most of our conception of uh, street art. Or, um, or perhaps Michael Kutche, he does a lot of beautiful, amazing uh, character designs and uh, he incorporates 3D into his character designs, into his concept art, which when he was first starting that, that was a very kind of new thing. Not a lot of people did that at all. Uh, for me, it was like Yoda. You know, when I saw the character Yoda, it made me change, it changed me, as well as when I watched The Matrix for the first time. You know, that was, it's not like... It's a type of art, it's a movie, but after you watch really good movies or you see really good art or you hear really good music, it literally changes you. And I feel like that is the top, top level of art, right? So how do you get there? That's probably the logical follow-up question, right? And how you get there is really, um, you wanna think about the emotional impact that you want to have on people. How do you want people to think about that piece of art when you're looking at that piece of art? The next part to that is to gear all of your technical skills, every skill you got, all your effort to making that emotional impact happen. And I think if, it's, if the emotional impact is strong enough and it really hits it on the head and um, and the last part to that is it's a good enough idea, then it'll change people. That's my own kind of hierarchy to, uh, you know, being an artist. Does that make sense? It's really, that was a really good answer. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and a lot of people, they don't, really concentrate on that in the beginning you know they don't really concentrate on um what the emotional impact is going to be when somebody looks at my piece of art instead they go okay is the structure good or is the perspective good that's all foundational stuff that's all like bottom stuff but it's it's the foundation that'll hold up the rest of the idea so it's super important Really good. Actually, it flows into my next question. So can I just keep going? Sorry. Yeah. I feel like it's just talking. Um, my next question was actually, um, there's certain questions that we ask ourselves during the art journey. So like at the beginning, it was things like, you know, what brush should I use? And then later on, I feel like these days it's more on what message do I want to say as an artist? Um, for your so when Imaginism I, Studios started, so it was just a few. Asking yourself consistently, or do you think there are certain questions that we haven't been asking ourselves as artists, or we should ask ourselves more? Uh, the one that I really like is the idea of where, where am I headed? You know, if I keep doing this, whatever it is, my routine, where am I headed with this? How's it going and where am I headed? You know, you, you wanna constantly think about uh, effort, versus time versus logic, time's logic, I, I would say. 
you know so you need to have the effort but then you also need to put in enough time with that level of effort and the last one is logic um, if you have all three you're headed in a really good direction the the other thing I kind of I kind of tell people is um, if you have time on your side art is easy being an artist is easy because you have time on your side when we come up with our goals a lot of times we come up with these like six month goals you know I want to do this in six months I want to do this in a year some people have like a month goal and usually all of these kind of time increments it's it's way too short we we overestimate what we can do in a month in six months in a year but we generally we underestimate what we can do in a lifetime in 20 years in 10 years and for you to if you have a goal say your goal is I want to be a director at ILM I want to be a director at Bad Robot at you know Disney Pixar whatever if that's your goal uh, and that's your 10 year goal I feel like yeah you can do that I feel like everybody can absolutely do that it's not like everybody is going to do that because they need to make the right moves right they need to concentrate on that goal or whatever um, but if that is their goal for the next 10 years hey schoolism has only been around for 13 years you know what I mean like 13 years ago I knew nobody in the industry I was not doing anything I was I was doing the most mediocre I was the computer guy at some other places studio and I don't even know computers that much you know time changes a heck of a lot and that's why it's like if you have time on your side oh my goodness art is super easy because we all have the opportunity we all have the potential you know you don't need to be in the prime of your life like you got to be in your 20s to really kick some butt you can be in your 40s you can be in your 50s it doesn't really matter it's not like being an, an athlete right so I forget what the question was but uh you answered it real good it's cool <laughs> thank you <laughs> You're and welcome. it's true, I used to be an accountant, actually, so I made my change, so yeah. And so what did you do before uh, before the workshop house? Oh, I'm freelancing, so I'm actually freelancing for projects, like a really cool one was Rise of the Ninja Turtles, that's coming out right now, um, children's illustrations, but before then it was commercials and before then it was accounting. And then what did you want to, now I'm interviewing you, I'm going to interview mode now. No, uh, no. So. <laughs> Let's jump to question. <laughs> well, I just want to ask like, um, what were you hoping to learn from coming to the, the schoolism house? I think I just wanted a moment, just a special moment in time. I wasn't asking for too much, just a time for myself to practice, to meet awesome people, and just, I guess, a treasured memory. <laughs> okay. And time to reflect and introspect with myself. Okay, cool, very cool. Um, yeah, why don't we go on to the next question? Let's let's do a question from the audience first, okay? Because they're asking a bunch of questions as well. Uh, Robin asks, "How do you get new creative ideas instead of drawing the same thing over and over again?" That one's a really good one, especially because it's like I feel like that kind of stuff never stops being a problem. You know, especially when you are just learning in the beginning you learn like one thing and you only have kind of like one thing in your repertoire of stuff that you're able to paint and draw really well you tend to do it over and over again but then as well when you become a professional uh, you also tend to do the same thing over and over again because you get known for a certain something so for me it's like character designs 
So what does that mean? That means I stop doing these really complex compositional images where there's like uh, maybe a character up close and a character further away and another character, you know, so on and so forth, or complex perspective because because I'm doing character design, you want to see everything pretty kind of clear uh, right in front of you. So then it doesn't call for a lot of that stuff, right? So for me, I kind of make it a point to always schedule in time to work on my own art, to always be learning something new. And that is kind of like a simple answer but it might seem kind of hard to do because so many people, they work so hard, they study so hard so that they can get a job. And once they get a job, the first thing that goes is the stuff that got them there, you know, is the studying, is the taking classes or whatever it might be. Uh, but at the same time, you, especially you, Jenny, you know, you're a freelancer, so you're in charge of your own schedule, and that allows you to actually make your own schedule, right? And you can always add those things in. Yeah, but then you get a bit of anxiety because you're like, oh no, when does the schedule end? It doesn't end. This is my life now. <laughs> <laughs> well, another anxiety thing when you're freelance is oh, maybe I should just take this job because I don't know when the next job is coming from or where it's going to come from, right? And that becomes like a big kind of nervousness for a lot of freelancers as well because as you probably know, a lot of people that don't have jobs, what do they say when you say, hey, what are you doing now? Oh, I'm freelancing. <laughs> you know, it's almost like this like thing that we say so that we don't have to say we're unemployed. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's something very common, too. And for anybody out there that's feeling that, you want to just realize if you work on your name and you get that network big enough, nobody can take away your name. That will be with you forever and ever. And so it's, it's definitely something worth investing in and building up. And once you have a big enough name, hey, a lot of times if – um, if I just if I'm looking for more work I'll just make a bunch of personal art put it up there for whatever kind of stuff I want to do and it generally attracts that kind of work because in, if enough people are following me then they're going to look at that and they're going to go hey I have a bear project yeah that guy just drew a bear I'm going to ask him to draw a bear for me it's kind of that that cut and dry really yeah which is a funny thing because we never really think about that when we're in school we never really think about okay um what kind of network do we have right now in terms of uh being an artist and such you know and how do i build that network we don't really i don't know when i was in school we never talked about that i don't know about you guys no. 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 Well, yeah, when when I was in school, it was like you know, late 90s, early 2000s, so the internet it you couldn't really do much with the internet at that point anyways. So, why don't we go to another uh schoolism house question? You guys got a good one? Wow. You guys know. um, <laughs> yeah, um, I would like to know which class uh, do you recommend to begin with um, in schoolism for people who doesn't know like what they want to do yet? Um, if I don't know if I want to focus on character or background or what my strengths are or what should I do? Great question. Uh, usually you know, I hate using the word depends for an answer because that's a, you know, crappy answer, but it kind of depends on what kind of stuff you would like to do the most. And a lot of times, if you don't know, you just got to sit there and really think about, well, what do I find enjoyable? What do I find a little easier? Not 
what do I think is in demand, not what do I think will get me a job the quickest, but just more of where do your passions lie? Because to get to the very, very top of the mountain, you have to have the passion, right? If it's only about security and money, human nature has a way of um, taking away your motivation once you have a good amount of that, even though you're not even close to your potential, right? So kind of getting that down first is important. And then after that, um, what I would suggest is just trying one of them because if you have a Schoolism subscription, then that means that you have access to all the courses, right? So then I would just start off with whichever course I th I'm thinking. I could tell you the ones that are too advanced for beginners. Craig Mullen's class is too advanced for beginners, right, T? You're, you took that class. Yes, it's a great class. But, you know, um, it's really advanced, but we work on values, which is uh, something you think is simple. But once you hear Craig Mullins talk about it, you realize that this thing that you thought you knew, you didn't really realize how important it was. Yeah. But it's a great class. Great class. Yeah, that... Um... That one is a really good class. And then uh, super advanced. And then, let's see here. I'm doing that one in December. I'm really excited, <laughs> but okay, so I'm kind of really scared now. <laughs> I'll, I'll get you ready for okay. it. Thank you, G. Thank you. Yeah, that class is fantastic. Also, Painting with Light and Color with Tonko House is fantastic. That one's quite challenging, but as well, beginners can take that class. So a lot of the classes on Schoolism, most of them, uh, here's how you know it, it's a good class. When you can really understand it, it's very simple concepts to understand, but very hard to master. Those are fantastic classes usually. And I'll tell you why. It's because I found with really, really great artists that are really, really great teachers, they're able to distill a ton of knowledge into a statement that's so simple. You know, and that, that is something that's kind of like true with all really, really great classes. Like the Craig Mullins thing, he uses these simple concepts but the way that he explains it and the way he executes and all this stuff, it has people that are working on Star Wars taking his class. You know, like all the biggest, baddest artists love that class. Um, but for me, if I was to start all over again, doing the classes all over again, I would take Steven Silver's uh, Fundamentals of Character Design and I would take uh, Alex Wu's gesture drawing class and uh and the tonko house painting class those three to begin with and uh and then i i would just spread out and just keep you know just take a, a new class every few months but to make sure that i would spend a good amount of time on the class and then um do the assignments, do the assignments, look at other people's feedback and change the assignment after that according to feedback. You know, too many people, they kind of, we've gotten into this habit of binge watching so much, like, oh, if I watched it, then I did it, you know? But art isn't like that. Art is like, it's tough. <laughs> Why don't we go? Oh my God, you guys. That looks yeah. so easy. <laughs> What's that? You're like art is art, and they're all like yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's it's tough, but it's easy because we have the potential. We have the ingredients to do it. 
you know, and it becomes easy because it's hard. Because like when something's hard, not a lot of people put in the effort, which makes it easy for us because as long as long as we put in the effort, then we can, you know, become really good artists. Yeah. Why don't we go on to another question and we'll go on to audience question. Jose, you want to ask a question? You have a couple questions here, right? After, after the audience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Why don't we go to audience question here? So, uh, you were... was that? Go for it. Okay. Uh, Kenny asks, "What's your opinion on sleeping early, waking up early, versus sleeping late and waking up late?" Some people find the former to increase productivity. I found that most really successful people get up early. They don't stay up late. But there's kind of like, uh, there's always exceptions to the rule. And then I've heard that some people, or for people, in, for various people, it depends on your kind of like your own genetic makeup, how, how, uh, how well you are to adapting to waking up early or to waking up late. I used to stay up really late, right? Like when T and I, we lived together in the same house, we would stay up till like four or five in the morning. Yeah. Right. But then we tried all schedules. Yeah. Well, I was always kind of running away from your schedule because <laughs> I was like, oh man, people are still up, you know, four o'clock in the morning. I want to be alone to like have time to concentrate on my own stuff. So then I changed my schedule to getting up at 5 a.m. instead of you know going to sleep at 5 a.m. And I I personally I love the whole entire idea of getting up really early because that by by the nature of the sentence it feels like you're getting ahead instead of I stay up really late, which means by nature, it's like I'm always behind. <laughs> you know, and the other thing is when you see the sunrise, that is such a motivator for so many people. Because you're seeing something magnificent, beautiful in, in nature, but you also are seeing something that you know most people are not seeing. You know what I mean? When you see the sunrise, you're like, wow, that's a little bonus for getting up early. I really love that. So what do you think now? You, you got a question for me, Jose? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's if you have, a, do you have advice uh, to keep your skills up? Uh, Sorry, I was asking. Do you have any advice to keep your skills update and strong with the fast evolution and changes of the industry? Did you, did you hear? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, advice to kind of like level up your your game in the industry, in your career. That is always changing. Yeah, that's always changing. That's, you know, a lot of people, they say, oh, art is hard. There's all these people that are more talented than I am. Well, um, that's the change in the industry is the biggest advantage for us, right? Because every time something changes, all of a sudden it opens up these new doors, these new possibilities, and there's nobody in that has gone through those doors just yet. So for me, it was like, what was one of like the new things for me that really helped? Well, the internet in general, you know, that really helped because all of a sudden I didn't have to just work for uh, Canadian companies. I could, you know, work for people uh, in California or now there's a lot of work coming in from China as well. They're all making movies too. Um, social media is another huge one so every time that there's something new and something that's really hot, uh, get in there. Get in there and start learning it because that's, that's, the, that's a huge opportunity. And it's kind of like a wave, you know? It kind of comes kind of like the waves of the ocean. 
Okay, if you get into the water too early, well, then you're going to get pummeled by the wave because the wave's just going to crash over top of you and then you're, you're not going to be able to surf or anything like that. If you're too far behind and you see the wave and you're like anticipating, anticipating, and then you wait for it to go a little bit and you go, oh, should I do it, should I do it? And then you climb in, uh, you're not going to feel any of the benefits either because the wave would have went by. Uh, so timing is a thing. Right? You want to be on the tip of that wave. As soon as that technology, as soon as that trend is coming in, you grab your artistic surfboard, you get on that wave, and you start surfing. That's when really great things will happen. And I don't know if this is a good segue, but I did want to mention that the Schoolism House, we've been doing it for quite a while. It's been an awesome awesome experience and uh, we are actually planning on stopping the schoolism house next year I don't know if you guys know that but we are planning on stopping the schoolism house so uh, you guys are one of the last people to do the schoolism house experience um, the very last one I believe is going to be when did we say T? It's uh, March, April, 2019. Right, March or April, 2019. So that means that there's only a few more little groups, you know, that, that are going to uh, experience the Schoolism House. So if any of you guys are interested out there, definitely uh, sign up. Right now we are registering for November, December. So after that, it's what, December, January. Or January. Uh, no, December. After that is January, February, and uh, March. That's right. It. Right. So four more sessions of the Schoolism House. It's uh, it's definitely bittersweet, but at the same time, we created this Schoolism House experience for the art community. Right. It's a passion project, and uh, it does take a lot a lot a lot of everything to keep the house going and the biggest component is actually tea for somebody to want to uh, be okay with living with different people you know all the time teaching people having the patience you know I, I have a lot of patience but I can definitely say T has more patience than I do so um, yeah anybody out there interested or if you know anybody interested don't let them miss this opportunity because the last uh, schoolism house opportunity is is next year april march april all right so yeah i don't want to dwell on that too much because it is a very kind of sad thing that um when i think about it but at the same time i do feel really really proud and happy of everybody that kind of came through the house and now it's been a while so we've gotten to see a lot of these people you know succeed and start doing their thing which has been very very awesome anyhow um why don't we go on to the next question here so i guess do you want to go back to jenny you want to go back to you if you have a yeah, sure. If you you want more questions from me, <laughs> sure, I'd love um, to. These days, there's so many great artists around us. It's hard not to be influenced by you know the greats. And sometimes you see so many, like you see someone's artwork, and you're like, I know who you're looking at. Um, do you have any tips on one finding your voice, I guess, as an artist, and keeping it strong? Yeah, finding your voice and keeping it strong. Well, our voice, a lot of times, our literal voice and the words that we say isn't even our own voice. It's accumulation of our own thoughts. It's our own experiences, plus people that have influenced us, like our parents, things like that, and we take their values and whatever. So what I'm saying is that's the same with your art style. Your art style is not 
just your art style. It's the stuff that influenced you, the stuff that inspired you, all these different things. Even people that have been self-taught, quote unquote self-taught, they still looked at other stuff. You know, they saw a movie, got inspired, started learning, and they went to a museum, started learning. Um, so that's where really great styles come from. Finding yourself, I, I feel like finding your own kind of voice comes through sorting through a lot of information and then just taking the stuff that you like and dismissing, you know, not dismissing, but like putting away the things that you don't like. Maybe just kind of put it on the shelf. Like I learned that. I'm not going to use it right now. I'm going to just kind of put it there in my mental library on the top shelf. Right. And sorting through enough stuff and learning each one of these things before you kind of go, OK, do I keep this or do I use it? The stuff that we tend to use is stuff that we tend to like. That's very that's very logical. Right. We don't generally paint things that we don't like or use things that we don't like. So as we start gathering all this different information, we are keeping the things that we really like. And a lot of times that speaks about us as a person, right? So if you really want to find your own voice, Jenny, it's, to, it's through looking through a whole bunch of other stuff and gathering information. The stuff that you keep, that information becomes part of your style and you kind of screw it in somewhere and it kind of has a little bit of influence more and more, right? Where people go wrong is a lot of times they might look at one thing and go, that's my thing, I love that thing, and I'm going to keep doing it, and you become a watered-down version of that thing. And you don't want that either. You want to continue. That's one of like the hardest things for me to kind of say to my students when I was teaching in college. It was like, okay, you learned all this stuff from me, practice it yes but after that look for somebody else's way look for contradicting ways look for you know whatever kind of information you can because that's how you're going to develop as an artist right and the the other part about that is how do you make a strong voice how do you make a strong style well that was something i thought a lot about as well and it's the same thing. You will have a very strong style if it's through sifting through a lot of information, learning each piece of information, and seeing what you like, putting it into your style. Because now you're creating a style that's based off of a lot of really good information, really good knowledge. And when you do that, you have a very strong style. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, yes. fine. thank you. You're welcome. Um, why don't we go to another question from the audience? So we have uh, Shatayu. Shatayu asks, Bobby, do you suggest working at a studio before start freelancing at the beginning of one's career? By the way, thank you for schoolism. I'm able to get the priceless education available here in India. Right on. You know, I, I one of the most kind of gratifying things that we've done with schoolism through these subscriptions that I never really thought of was like not just give people this sounds very commercially but I don't give a shit uh, not not just give people affordable education but to give a lot of people that never actually thought that they could afford education at all you know that ability to learn which is fantastic so really uh, really nice comment there do I suggest working at a studio first before you start freelancing it doesn't matter I think it really doesn't matter the one thing that is in common uh, with both situations working at a studio or working freelance just on your own is that you always want to keep making sure that you have your 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 mind on the target and the target is to get better get m more and more better information right so as long as you're learning I say it doesn't matter 
right? And that makes perfect sense because if you started off in a studio and they do whatever, not challenging stuff for you and you're not learning, then I would say that that's the wrong choice, that you should go freelance. But same thing, if you're doing freelance and you're not really learning, then I would say, no, that's, that's not the right way to do it either. Right, so it really depends on how much um, you're actually learning in whatever situation you're in. So I guess uh, if you guys at the house have any questions, let me know as well. Or we can just keep going. Up to you. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, how to know when you finish a painting or a project? Because I get caught up on final details all the time and I can go on and on and on and on. Take a break. Uh, that seems to be the best way for me is just like take a break, come back with some fresh eyes. Uh, that could just be a five minute break. It could just be getting a coffee or whatever and come back and check it out again. Um, the other one is, you know, ask somebody for their opinion, but you want to make sure like that you're selective with who you're asking because not everybody knows what they want, you know, and, and some people give really good advice. And it doesn't mean that you have to ask somebody that's super skilled, some really, really skilled artist, even though a lot of times that is probably who you want to ask. But I'm saying not necessarily because sometimes, you know, you ask your mom or your dad or whatever, and, and they actually have a really good eye, right? And they can actually tell you, no, it should be like that. Sometimes you have really good producers on a film that help you with that as well because they have the kind of eye that the audience would have, right? And they're not looking at it from an artistic standpoint, um, and that becomes a lot helpful as well. Does that make Thank sense? You. Yeah, yeah, totally. Thank you. So, uh, not too long ago, Vouter, Vouter Tulp came to the house. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Now, that's a guy that is very interesting because, like, when, when uh, Jenny, you were talking about finding your own voice and having a a strong voice how many voices does he have right he has about yeah. a billion voices he has about a billion styles and he just keeps learning and learning so what did he actually end up teaching you guys he thought about character design but we talk about exactly what you're talking about right now and uh, it felt like he was still looking for his own voice, but he likes learning. And that was interesting to see a guy like Walter still uh, thinking about that. Oh yeah, and he was taking that Craig Mullins class too, the one that I was talking about. Yes. Yeah. It was really cool seeing some of the new stuff that he was doing. And yeah. For those of he you that are watching the video, that's Wouter, he's the tall guy. Uh, these are all pictures uh, from his recent stay at the schoolism house. It was amazing. The week with Walter was like amazing. We made fires outside. Uh, we swam. Uh, we went to farm see animals. Uh, he was teaching the students every day, giving them homework. And uh, his wife and his son were amazing. It was like a did you play there? Yeah, we painted outside, planner painting. We did everything. Yeah. yeah. Everything. It was amazing. Oh, that's great. Well, uh, I got to take his class as well. And even though I do character design, it's always so helpful when you see how somebody else does something that you like to do or that you do, you know, as a profession. It only helps to add, add to your overall voice and the strength of your voice. Um, he, he's a great teacher. 
and he tested stuff for his next class on us. Oh, right on. Yeah, he yeah he did mention that he is uh he's working on a new class. Uh, yes. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it's gonna be great. Awesome. <laughs> Why don't we go to another um. And by all means, if you guys have anything that you want to add in or whatever, just feel free to, you know, just speak up and say whatever, okay? So the next one, next question um, is from, let's go to Kelly Ramirez asks, how do you self-critique when you're studying at home? Forums help, but how do you train yourself to be a critic for your own art? That one's really tough, right? Because um, especially in the beginning, you don't know what you don't know. So you might think something looks awesome, but uh, then a professional comes over and goes, what about this and that and this and that? And you go, oh, which is the normal kind of situation instead of like the opposite where you kind of look at your stuff and you go, ah, oh, I don't like it. And some professional goes, wow, that's amazing. You did everything right. Uh, I don't know <laughs> if there's a situation where that would happen. Like a fantasy situation. Yeah, but, you know, even though I have lots of people that I can bounce ideas off of, show really, you know, show my art to and get really good opinions, uh, it still is very important for me to kind of uh, practice looking at my art from the secondary point of view, from the, from the viewer's point of view, the intended viewer. So, you know, because sometimes you, I, I'll get these projects where it's like, this is for an 11-year-old girl. This one is for a 10-year-old boy, you know, and I got to kind of put my head into that audience. Right, so I feel like that is one thing that you can actually just improve just by consciously trying to get into the head of that person. Um, but if you're all alone, well, nowadays I say you're never all alone because you have the internet. And really, yeah, it might be like, Okay, it might be a situation where you don't know any artists. You don't know anybody on the internet, really, anybody that is kind of like in the same vein as what you do in terms of creativity or art. So how do you get that other opinion? Because nobody notices your stuff. Okay, so this one's pretty simple. Look at how many followers you have. Maybe it's 10, maybe it's 100, maybe it's 1,000. Okay? If you have 100 followers, go to people that have 200 followers. Comment on their stuff in a genuine way. Look at their stuff. Think about it. Respond. And then post your, your own art. I guarantee you that there will be a fraction that will go, oh, cool, I got this comment. Oh, I, cool, I got this like or whatever. I'm going to go check out this person's art and tell them what I think as well. And if you ended up, you know, genuinely thinking about what to say and all that for like 50, 100 people and only, you know, three people responded to your stuff, it's probably not that hot right now. You know, you probably need to level up somehow, somewhere. Um, and the other thing is when you post, post that you want feedback. Post that you you're not looking for, you know, pats on the back necessarily. You're looking for feedback, and then people will be a lot more kind of genuine with their feedback. I remember I was in um, I was in a workshop one time where there. By the way, I didn't vet all of these pictures, so there are kind of some silly pictures there. Uh, no. These were all taken from. <laughs> these yeah. are all taken from Browder's okay. wife, right? Oh. Yeah. So. <laughs> some fun times at the house, I see. <laughs> I don't know what you're looking at. I don't know if I want to. Okay. Cool. Uh, 
yeah, so I forget where we're going with that, but oh yeah, critiquing your own art. Um, yeah, generally, if there isn't that many comments, then it hasn't really hit the spot yet. But I would, like I said, I would look at people around the same kind of followers as me, because if you respond to like a hundred people with a hundred thousand followers or more, you're probably you're probably not going to get very many responses at all, at all, because they're just too busy or whatever. Right, but if you had the same amount of followers, then most likely they would have the chances of them hearing about you as well is higher. And then when that happens, they're more likely to respond to you. Right, so you kind of climb up the ladder with all the other people as well, if that makes sense. Yes, cool. Any other questions, or should I go on to another audience question? Uh, who's your favorite uh, favorite character, um, animation character, or film character? Yeah, my favorite character is Yoda. <laughs> it's Yoda. You know, when I was a little kid, I was watching Star Wars, the very, very first one. Or, sorry, Yoda didn't come until the second one. But anyways, the first time I saw Yoda, I remember I was watching it with my dad and I was I was uh I was a little nervous or scared, you know, I was a little kid. And I go I go to my dad, he's like, "What's wrong? What's wrong?" I'm like, "Dad, where are the Chinese people in the future?" <laughs> and and he, you know, cuz there's like no Chinese characters. Oh. And he was like, "Don't worry, son. Yoda Yoda's Chinese. And I was like, really? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, if you grow to 600 years old, you'll look just like Yoda. And so after that, I was like, wow, I like that character. That's my favorite character. <laughs> and now that I see my grandma, she's 101, I'm like, yeah, maybe. Maybe you do start looking like Yoda when you get older. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, why don't we go to another question here because there's a bunch coming in. Hobbs asks, uh, where am I able to find people to talk about art, share art, and also learn art together in a more social sharing way? Healthy competitive learning. Well, um, if you have a Schoolism subscription anyways, there is the Schoolism Facebook group, which is really, it's all about getting feedback, getting people to critique your stuff. Uh, so if you're already a Schoolism subscriber, then you can definitely do that. You guys have a pretty hardcore group as well, the Schoolism House, uh, you know, in-house workshop artists. You guys have a group which is always very active. Uh, but... I guess if you don't, which is kind of like the situation that I had when I was starting off. Um, back then, it was conceptart.org or this other forum called eatpoo.com, which <laughs> eatpoo was always notorious for giving you nothing but critiques. You know, it's like hardly any compliments. It was always like trying to find the poo in your art and making you eat it, I guess. I don't know. Maybe that's where the name came from. Uh, but nowadays, it seems to be Art Station. That's the place. Yeah. And would you say Subway Sketching was kind of that a little bit? Subway Sketching, sure. Yeah. Uh, so for those of you out there that don't know what, what, what T is talking about, we used to go subway sketching every Sunday on the, uh, on the subways of Toronto. And whoever would join us, you know, they'd join us for free. We'd teach them, you know, if they have anything cool to teach us, we're all ears. And it was just this wonderful period of time where we're just learning from each other on the subways of Toronto. And it was just like this free event that was just happening every Sunday. 
but now since I am traveling so much, uh, you know, we don't do that uh, activity anymore. But I do miss it quite a lot. You can do an airport sketching. <laughs> that's a great one. Anywhere where people are waiting for stuff, right? Where they got nowhere to go. Perfect scenario for doing some observational sketches. Yeah, I like that airplane or airport sketching. That sounds sketch. great. Uh, a friend of ours, T, Danesh, he used to go um, jury sketching. Like he would go to the courts and he wasn't paid yeah. to sketch. He wasn't, I don't think he was even paid to sketch there. He would just go there and sketch people, which is kind of like, I don't know how I feel about that because there's definitely kind of situations where it's very emotional as well. Like you're in court and you're trying to get out of a bad situation or whatever, and somebody's sketching your face, you know? Yes. And I don't know if you remember in The Sopranos, but. There's an episode where the mafia boss is really pissed off at the sketch someone did of him. Oh, jeez. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking about when I think about jury sketching. Like, yeah, that'd, what be, if I sketch? that'd be funny. That'd be funny. You know, if like some mafioso person is noticing that you're sketching and then you go over to check out the sketch or he comes over to check out the sketch and it's like some cartoony version of yourself yeah <laughs> that'd be funny um yeah you guys have any other questions or we could go to another question that from the audience jenny yeah sorry what was that it broke up for a sec uh, Jenny had a good question that I'm going to ask for her. Um, do you have a favorite book or audio book? Oh, I have tons. I have tons. Or podcast. All right. Uh, let's give a list to the audience and to you guys of my favorite audio books ever. Uh, one is my top, my top book that I've listened to over and over and over and over again is uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That one's pretty classic. Um, it's just a wonderful book, not just how to kind of organize your life and kind of be more productive and all that stuff, but it makes you want to be a better person as well. And it really doesn't just help you be an effective like person in your career, but it helps you be an effective person with relationships you know friends family that kind of thing wonderful book um and uh other ones that come to the top of my head is uh is think and grow rich that one's a really good one it's not like i want to be rich but it's the book is it's much more about think of a big goal and achieve that big goal, right? So that one's fantastic. Um, there's one called The Placebo Effect, which is awesome. It talks about placebo effects, how you, know, you think a, a pill is going to cure you, and because you think it's going to cure you, it really does cure you. Uh, what's the science behind that and how can we use that science to to strengthen our beliefs on things that we really want to believe you know so for me um, that actually helped me with my arm as weird as this sounds you know I had a I have a bad arm right now and still got its problems but it's it's gone a long way you know, it's improved a lot. Um, and this book made me realize, oh, your body also kind of has a mind of its own. And when you talk with uh, physiotherapists or acupuncturists or, you know, that kind of vein of, of study, they can say, yeah, your body is trying to protect itself now. You know, you have, 
you had an accident, you hurt yourself somewhere, your body's trying to protect you. And if you don't watch it, sometimes your body will always think that you have a bad arm. It keeps trying to protect that area, right? So you stop flexing the wrong muscles, you st or you stop flexing the right muscles. You stop using the right muscles to get something to happen. And that was a lot of my problem, that I had the arm problems for so long that my muscles stopped working that the, the way that they should. And the placebo effect helped to explain this and in the end helped me to kind of uh, figure a way out of it. And for me, it was the guy that wrote the placebo effect, Dr. Joe Dis Dispenza, he also has these meditative, um, guided meditations that he has on his site. And one of them is to, to help change whatever kind of thing that you want to improve in your body, right? So for me, it was, it was a, a good arm, right? I want to believe, I want to feel, I, I really want to envision that my arm is good it's just a little busted up right now, but it's actually good, and it can get back to 100%. So that one, um, what else is there? There's so many. Right now, I'm like locked out of my Audible account. But uh, podcasts, The Jordan Harbinger Show, The Jordan Harbinger Show, that's one I've been listening to lately. He's a pretty good interviewer, and he's a smart guy. And he's always getting these people on that um, deal something with communication. So, like, how to be an introvert in an extrovert's world. Or uh, the secrets you don't know about negotiation. You know, why you should stop trading time for money these are just a couple of like the titles in his uh podcast it's a really awesome one i like that one and another one is uh big questions with cal fussman so cal fussman he interviewed a lot of people um over his years he was at esquire for a long time and he was sent to interview people like gorbachev or muhammad ali or um Larry King or whoever. So he has all these years on him of like asking really good questions. And a lot of times I love listening to his stuff because his really good questions always lead to these really good profound answers. Um, yeah, so there's a few. And then a couple other audiobooks off the top of my head. Uh, a Game Plan for Life, which is written by uh, John Wooden. One of the, he is like the most winningest college co coach ever in basketball history. Um, the Art of Learning with Josh Waitzkin. He was the inspiration for that movie. Um, finding Bobby Fisher and so he was at his prime in his chess career he was number one and then later on he became number one in Wen Chun uh, martial arts two totally different sounding kind of things things that people would spend their whole entire lives to master yet he mastered both of these totally different things you know in a short amount of time generally a short amount of time and it's because he concentrated on how to learn as opposed to how to become a better chess master, how to become a better Wen Chun fighter or freestyle diver or whatever. He concentrated on how do I, how do I learn to learn really well? So there you go. There's a bunch. Yeah, if I had my list, it's literally like a giant list because uh, I love listening to audiobooks when I work. I don't really listen to 
I don't usually watch TV or listen to music. I barely ever listen to music when I'm working. Uh, yeah. Cool. Next question. Any other questions from you guys? Or should we go to audience question? Do I audience? Okay, let's go to the audience. So, um, Finlay BG asks, what's your opinion on cross-training your skills? I'm trying to do storyboarding, but I've been amazed by the doors that observational painting has been unlocking. I love cross-training skills. I love it. That's what's going to make you special. You know, a lot of times now, a lot of these really great artists are really, really good because they also kind of, like you're saying, cross-train skills. Um, for example, one that just comes off to, uh, the top of my head is uh, Igor Alban Chevalier, the Black Frog, who's going to be in, um, he's actually going to be in Dublin October 20th, 21st. Schoolism Live down there. Uh, he does a lot of live action films. He knows how to paint. He knows how to draw like nobody's business. But he also knows a heck of a lot about uh, 1920s, 1930s stuff. He can look at a piece of machinery or whatever and go, yeah, that's not made in the 1920s. Or that, that is made in the 1920s. You know, so... Um, because he has that second skill, it makes him like a no-brainer for so many projects, right? And for me, like, I really like animals. I really like how different kind of beings live, survive, thrive. Uh, so for a lot of, like, creature kind of stuff, then all of a sudden that becomes a no-brainer, right? Um, and then you have Steve Jobs, who knew typography, right? And that revolutionized the computer. He wasn't just a person that knew how to create a computer company or whatever. So that's why it's like, it's all about gathering information, as much information as you can, because the more you do, the, the the more unique, the better the voice that you're going to have, the more value you're going to bring. Um, I've heard stories of people working on a James Cameron film with James Cameron, and they're in the room, and then you have these like high-level physicists in the room too, right? And they're talking about some crazy whatever technology and then James Cameron will actually correct them and go, no, no, but this study later on, this proved that that was not true. And so what you're saying is actually it should be like this. And then these like super crazy physicists are like, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, so the name of the game is really it's learning. It's high level learning, constant learning. That's what's going to really, really improve your stuff big time. Let's go to, yeah, and feel free to, like I said, feel free to jump in with any other questions that you guys have or whatever. Um, but let's go to Gerard. Gerard asks, how do you unlearn what's considered poor artistic habits? Oh, that's a good, really good question. Uh, you know what? I guess I'm trying to think if I have. Yeah, I've had some bad habits, too. I think it's just a real like forcing yourself not to go down that path over and over again and try to go down the good path. So for example, um, I'll use uh, Craig Mullins for an example. In his class, he gets you to really concentrate on shape design, right? It, especially for your values and things like that, how to distill a very complex image into just like two values, right T? Yeah. 
Yes. Right? So I'm of the habit of building stuff up from very close contrast. Right? And he's about building up stuff from like opposite values. High, high, high contrast. Right? Yeah, from extremes. Yeah. So I don't know if my habit is bad or whatever, but when I was taking his class, I would just force myself not to do that. You know, not get tones that are very close together and start working on it like that. I would just put that black, you know, paint in my hand or that white paint in my hand and I would just work with that. I think the real key there that will stop a lot of people from continuing poor artistic habits is just getting used to the frustration of learning something new. And getting out of your comfort zone. Yeah. For you, I think you're a perfect kind of candidate to answer this question. How do you kind of, you know, you had to adopt all these new artistic habits, art habits, right? Do you yeah, have any feel, advice? Um, you know, I feel that I don't think I've, I never thought about how do I get rid of bad habits, but I think it'd be the same thing as how do I get new habits? So I think being an artist is about always evolving and always learning and constantly changing. And I think the real skill of being an artist is being able to change what you do, assimilate new information and constantly evolving. So um, I find that uh, doing Craig's class uh, was really amazing class. And, you know, it starts with some very simple value exercise that you're like, you could easily be like, oh, I know that. I don't need to do that. But I feel uh, the best way to approach it is like, you know what? If Craig Mullins want me to work on two value things, then I'm going to give it a try and try to figure out why he wants uh, us to work on that and why it's so important to him that he choose to build his whole class around this. So I feel uh, to answer the question, uh, being open-minded and be uh, willing to try new things and to figure out uh, why, like, you know, you, you can get bad habits from uh, suspicious people, I guess, <laughs> but you know, when you choose uh, good teachers and people you trust, I feel you gotta trust them and just um, do what they uh, ask you to do and then try to figure out why they want you to do that to understand and that way i feel you can uh, change bad habits by new habits and constantly uh, add new stuff and i think being an artist is really uh, you have to be passionate about learning and changing and constantly evolving perfect i couldn't say it say it better myself and that's why you're the instructor at the schools in house and if you if anybody out there, you know, has a real bad problem with bad art habits, uh, the Schoolism House will definitely break all of those habits and build everything from the ground up again. Yep. Right? <laughs> yeah. And I'm patient. So even if you're stubborn, I'll be more stubborn than you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you will. <laughs> yeah, and only... There's what three, three more um, sessions that are open for registration, something like that. Uh, last one being March, April of 2019. You can go to the address below, schoolism.com/house.php to register, and uh, I wish you luck because it, it'll be a great experience. All right, everybody, so that's all the time that we have for today. I want to thank the audience, the online audience, and 
I want to give a big, a big special thank you to you guys at the house for trusting in us to, um, you know, give you some good guidance and teaching you guys uh, how to paint and draw. It's an honor. And thank you, Bobby, for the stream. It was uh, really fun, and it was cool for the students to meet you cool. and have a live talk. <laughs> well, yeah, why don't you guys stay on it for a second and I will put on a little uh, going away schoolism commercial, schoolism house commercial. So when Imaginism Studios started, it was just a few artists living and working in one house. No distractions, just art. Anytime, day or night, you can find somebody up, somebody to paint with. Our artistic skills grew extremely fast as a result. We loved the experience, so we created the Schoolism Lake House 30-day in-house workshop. The Schoolism Lake House is a unique and exciting opportunity for a hand-picked group of four applicants, just four, to be trained by professional artists in an inspiring and stimulating lakeside environment. If selected, you and three other applicants would be invited to move into the Schoolism House in Saint-Julien, Quebec, just outside of Montreal, Canada, for 30 days. Once there, you will follow the training program designed by Imaginism Studios for our new artists. You will become the personal apprentices of our senior artist, Thierry LaFontaine, affectionately known as T. As you learn drawing, painting, and digital painting from T and a special guest instructor. Past guests have included Nathan Fowkes, Steven Silver, Carcamo, Andrea Blasich, and many, many more. The Schoolism Lake House is dedicated to the training of concept artists based on the principle of learning by doing. For 30 intense days, you will live with T and acquire the essential art skills, daily practices, and philosophies that lead to a successful career as a concept artist in today's industry. Go to schoolism.com slash house.php for more info. At the beginning, you're always super nervous. I was thinking, oh, what am I... Uh be doing there with uh, another kind of people that I don't know. I wouldn't ever think it would be awesome for me to share space with three strangers for a month, but yet it is. We all come from different countries and we still we are like connected. I think place attracts right people and um, we all shared the same goal, so we wanted to learn. Every everybody was motivated to learn. I think that was the best experience ever. It's a base for an artist to start. A once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to learn. I thought that it would be harder, but no, it has been really great, really cool. Just being able to live and see how you guys work and approach art, how you uh, have this successful mentality. You're like full-time studying and it's so compressed, but you continue uh, fighting. I think it's more of a mindset that like as long as you try hard enough, it's totally achievable. It's just a matter of mentality, you need to switch the way you think. So now I can apply this sort of approach in all different, not only artist skills, but every other skill I do. If I will have another chance to do it again, definitely I would say yes. Expect, expect new experience, expect something you expect to stretch yourself in different ways. It's just amazing for me, it's like so inspiring.